Good morning. Welcome to this service on the 19th of July 2020. My name is Pastor Steve Mayo and I'm a Methodist minister in the South End and Lee Circuit in Essex. Our readings today are going to be uh, brought to us by Helen Boyd. Helen is a, a local councillor and also a member of Lee Wesley Methodist Church. So we will start this service today with our call to worship. Call to worship. I'm reading from the New International Version, Psalm 86, verses 11 to 17. Teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. I will praise you, O Lord my God, with all my heart. I will glorify your name for ever. For great is your love toward me. You have delivered me from the depths of the grave. The arrogant are attacking me, O God. A band of ruthless men seeks my life, men without regard for you. But you, O Lord, are a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Turn to me and have mercy on me. Grant your strength to your servant and save the son of your maidservant. Give me a sign of your goodness that my enemies may see it and be put to shame. For you, O Lord, have helped me and comforted me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Helen. Our opening hymn for this service is another great hymn of the church and can it be written by Charles Wesley?
I hope you enjoyed that good sing. Let us pray together. Dear Father God, we are grateful again that we can come before you in this way, in this service, an act of worship. And although we may be still separated, we are united through you and your spirit working within each one of us. We thank you, God, that as we look out of our windows, we see uh, the wonderful sunshine which lightens our hearts and gives us a sense of hope and gratitude for all that you give to each one of us every day. So, Father God, as our churches start to unlock and uh, we start to go back to acts of private worship and for some worship in, in general, I pray, Lord, that you would just keep us safe, that you would give us wisdom and understanding in the procedures that we need to undertake. And I pray, Lord, above all, that we would uh, have a sense of being reunited together in the next few weeks. So, Father God, be with us, I pray, as we continue to worship you now. Please teach us and help us to learn the lessons which you wish to teach us this day. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, let us say the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Our second reading for this service is again brought to us by Helen. Thank you, Helen. One Peter five verses eight to eleven. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm and steadfast. To him be the power for ever and ever. Amen. This be the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Even devil worshippers wear socks with sandals. Quite a title for the sermon, I suppose, and I'll explain that to you in a few moments' time. Peter wrote his first letter to the people of Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey, encouraging them to remain faithful, obedient, good citizens, so that the cause of Jesus wouldn't be damaged. And that is what we need to be in our world today, faithful to the gospel, so that our society can see God reflected in our lives. But we live in a world where temptation abounds. As Peter puts it in verse 8 of our reading, your enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. So who is this enemy and where did he come from? Well, we know this enemy as Satan, the devil or Lucifer. The name Satan comes from the Hebrew word Satan, which means adversary. And he appears under that name 55 times in the King James Bible, but he is only referred to as the devil in the New Testament. So where did Satan come from? Well, he's a, a fallen angel. Genesis 1:31 tells us when God created the world that he saw what he had made and he saw it was very good. This means that even the angelic world that God had created did not have evil angels or demons in it at that time. But by the time we get to Genesis chapter 3, verse 5, we find that Satan, in the form of a serpent, is tempting Eve to sin. Therefore, somewhere between the events of Genesis 1.31 and Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, there must have been a rebellion in the angelic world, with many angels turning against God and becoming evil. Through Peter chapter 2 verse 4 supports this when he says God did not spare angels when they sinned 
but sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment. And Jude chapter 6 says almost the same thing, nearly word for word. But after our reading today from Peter's first letter, there are two things which jumped off the page, which we need to be mindful of. The first is that we need to be watchful or alert. And the second is that we need to be hopeful. Firstly, then, we need to respect Satan. He is dangerous. One of my brothers, Nathaniel, works for Western Power as a linesman. A linesman is someone who is highly trained to climb up electricity poles and pylons to fix them when things go wrong. Often, when they are still live, having up to 66,000 volts going through them, and this is called live working. I often think about my brother hanging off some pylon in the middle of nowhere, inches from tens of thousands of volts, and in the past I've had to ask him, how do you do that? And his first response is, the first thing you have to do is respect it. Satan is a dangerous enemy. He is a serpent who can bite you when you least expect it. The definition of a serpent, as well as being a snake, is also a traitor, a liar, a cheat, a sneak, a troublemaker and a schemer. These are all very apt descriptions of the devil. The Bible describes devil in a, a number of different places with a number of different names. Revelation chapter 12 describes him as a destroyer and an accuser. And it says, the great dragon was hurled down, that ancient snake called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, now has come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before God day and night has been hurled down. And Zechariah 3 verse 1. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right side to accuse him. The devil also has great power and many great demons to help him attack us, God's people. He is a formidable enemy and we must never joke about him. We must never ignore him and we definitely must never underestimate his ability. Secondly, then, we need to recognize him because in 2 Corinthians 11, we are told he is a great pretender. It reads, for such people are false apostles deceitful workers masquerading as apostles of Christ and no wonder for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light it is not surprising then if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness their end will be what their actions deserve it is very unlikely that the devil will come to us looking like this in all probability He'll look like us. He'll look like this. And this is why we have this title for my message today. Even devil worshippers wear socks with sandals. I know this is a very stereotypical image of a Christian, but let me explain. One Sunday some time ago, when I was leading one of my services in one of my previous churches, a man came into the service quite late and he sat at the back. And I gave him a welcoming nod and a smile, and then I carried on with the service. But I did notice that he was wearing shorts with very long socks and sandals. And in my mind, I found this quite amusing. That this is what Christians are supposed to wear, isn't it? Anyway, after the service had finished, the man got up to leave the church very quickly. And I only just managed to catch him on his way out to shake his hand and to find out where he was from and to make him feel welcome to church. But I wasn't ready for his reply. He said, I am a devil worshipper, and for the last hour I have been praying for the downfall of your church. And he left. I was shocked, and I was quite taken aback. The devil is the great pretender. Hence, I titled this sermon, Even Devil Worshippers Wear Socks with Sandals. This is why we need to be alert, and we need to be watchful. 
My brother Nathaniel, who climbs those pylons, says that one of the biggest killers in his line of work is complacency. People getting careless and forgetting their training. What a great analogy for us as Christians. Maybe today we need a wake-up call. In his book entitled Discipleship, David Watson said, even amongst Christians who do believe in the devil's existence, there is often a marked blindness about the reality of spiritual warfare and the nature of the devil's tactics. How often do we not give the Satan a second thought? How often do we get involved in arguments which disrupt our church life or our home life or our work life, but don't give Satan the credit? How often do we think that Satan won't be interested in us? My brother also said that the biggest danger with electricity is the fact that you can't see it. He said you can see fire, you can smell gas, but you can't see or smell electricity. Satan can also be very hard to identify. And that's why we can't afford to be complacent and that we too need to remember our training our training in prayer, our training in Bible study, our training as living as God's chosen people. And by remembering our training, we can resist Satan. This means we can take our stand on God's word and refuse to be moved. His word is our weapon against Satan and his demons. Ephesians chapter 6 verses 10 to 11 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armour of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. We need to be watchful and we need to be alert and we need to be ready for the devil's attacks. So this message so far then, it can seem pretty heavy stuff, can't it? All this battling with Satan. But the latter part of our reading from 1 Peter 5 gives us a great hope. It says... And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm and steadfast. To him be the power for ever and ever. Amen. I think sometimes we need to remind ourselves that God is in complete control. No matter how difficult our trials may become, we as Christians always have hope. We have hope because we have a God of grace in our lives and he has grace to help us in every circumstance and in every situation. Annie Johnson Flint has written about this experience of God's grace in one of her hymns and it reads, He giveth more grace as our burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength as our labours increase. To added afflictions he addeth his mercy. To multiply trials, he multiplies peace. When we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed ere the day is half done, when we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving is only begun. His love has no limits, his grace has no measure, his power no boundary known unto men. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. God gives us the grace we need. In fact, he is the God of all grace. We have hope because as Christians, we know we are going to spend an eternity with God in heaven. 1 Peter 1 tells us, praise be to God, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, never spoil, never fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. The road may be difficult, but it leads to heaven. And that is all that really counts. Peter has given us a precious letter that encourages us to have hope in God, no matter how difficult times may be for us. Down through the centuries, the church has experienced various fiery trials, and yet the devil has not been able to destroy it. 
and the church today is still facing fiery trials, especially in some parts of the world that we see daily on our television screens. We must be watchful. We must be alert, but we must also be hopeful. I finish with the words of Jesus from John 16, verse 33. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Amen. As we take a few moments to inwardly digest what God has spoken to us today, about how we must resist the devil, we must be alert, but also must rely on his strength. We're just going to watch a presentation as we reflect, and uh, some passages of scripture will come up which will remind us of the solidity of our God that we can stand on and rely on in times of trial and temptation from the devil. Please watch, reflect, and listen to our God. Before we come to a, a time of intercessory prayer, which will be very specific today, based around the charity action for children, let us sing together our next hymn, Before the Throne of God Above, which is written by Charity L. Bancroft. Let's share together in this hymn.
as I said earlier, our intercessory prayer today or prayers will be quite uh, specific as we focus on a charity called Action for Children. This is a charity which was founded some 150 years ago this year. Uh, last Sunday was a, a special Sunday for Action for Children, but unfortunately I wasn't very well, so I didn't get to do a service. But I promised that I would uh, uh, support and we would pray for Action for Children as a, a charity. Um, as I said, it started 150 years ago with the Reverend Thomas Stevenson, who saw children living underneath Waterloo Station, London, and decided to do something about it, and not just to act physically, but also to listen to, to them before acting and to see what their needs were. In this uh, time of coronavirus, uh, I think all charities have suffered with loss of income, and uh, this charity is no different. And uh, they've put together a, a presentation, which I've adjusted slightly, and uh, it's to give us a little bit of information about what they're doing. And uh, hopefully you would feel in your hearts that you would like to support this important charity as they support young children and families in this country. So please watch this presentation before we have a prayer together. I wasn't allowed to shower, and I went days without food. My childhood didn't exist. I was 13 when my mum and dad started taking drugs. The drugs made them paranoid. That's when they'd get violent. They'd punch me or slap me. Sometimes they'd just spit on me or push me down the stairs. I would have to sneak food into my room if I wanted to eat. I could go days without getting anything. I had to go into school when I was 13 and ask if I was allowed to have a shower. But when mum and dad found out, they battered me. I didn't see the point anymore. They started locking me in the house. I was in a really bad state. I had nothing. My clothes were covered in holes. I knew I had to escape. I ran to Action for Children and they reminded me, I am enough. I want to make friends and live my life now. Without Action for Children, I don't think I'd be alive. Shall we pray together? Dear Father God, uh, as we watch this presentation and just seen that young life affected by a worldly situation, we are reminded how fortunate that we are. Father God, we pray for all those children and those families that are supported by Action for Children. We pray, Lord, that as we watch, that our hearts would be inspired to support to send our finances to help those less fortunate than ourselves. We pray for all who have contact with Action for Children. 
We pray for the staff who work there. We pray that you would just give them enthusiasm and strength and encourage them in the work in which they undertake. But Father God, help us to be mindful of those who have less than we do. And I pray, God, that you would just inspire us and fire us up to help those in need. And we ask this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for watching that presentation from Action for Children. And I'm sure we will all be challenged and have been challenged to open our hearts to that worthy cause. We come to our final hymn for this uh, service, entitled At the Name of Jesus, a very popular hymn written by Carolyn Maria Noel. Let's enjoy this hymn together. For joining me for this service today i hope you found this helpful and uplifting and i hope god has touched your hearts as we've thought about the plight of others in our world but let's conclude with a final benediction dear lord grant us thy peace throughout our earthly life our balm in sorrow and our stay in strife then when thy voice shall bid our conflict cease call us O lord to thine eternal peace Amen. May God bless each one of you.